Hey what's going on role players? it's the Bard here and welcome back to the corner and today I want to talk about illusions. So we're talking about illusions and specifically the school of illusion for the wizard and I tell you what some of these abilities look a little bit too powerful. Illusion at its heart is smoke and mirrors. It very rarely causes tangible effects, so it's the kind of school of magic that you have to be smart enough to fool your enemies with. If you're already adept at fooling others, however, and getting them to do the things that you want, then the school of illusion is offering you some really impressive abilities in the capacity to change the illusions that you've already got running. So what's happening then is you get pretty much carte blanche to do whatever you want, and that can be dangerous considering some of the abilities that the illusionist gets later on are actually really impressive. So like any wizard arcing tradition you're going to get savant, in this case obviously it's illusion savant, you're going to get cheap and time efficient copying of illusion spells into your spellbook. This is bog basic stuff and it doesn't really need to be gone into so we'll just move straight on to improve minor illusion. So you get the cantrip for free if you don't already have it but chances are, as an illusionist, you would have taken it. So it doesn't count against your number of cantrips known. So that's a great start already, and you're getting a free cantrip for nothing. But on top of that, it's actually better than the cantrip ought to be, because you're getting to do both the sound and the image at the same time. This is ridiculously good for low-level encounters, especially in like dungeons where there are a lot of paths that you can take. I mean, something as simple as some muddy footprints and the sound of you running up that corridor nine times out of ten might be enough to get the creature to come chasing down that pathway thinking that's where you've gone so you know, there's a, a lot that can be done with just a simple object and sound there's two core things that you want to remember when it comes to illusions first of all seeing is believing and secondly less is more because if you had something similar, like the example that I just used, muddy footprints and a, a sound of people running up another corridor, how often are you going to stop and look at those footprints? Are you going to stop and scrutinize over them? Are you going to poke and prod? Or are you just going to run around the corner and go, look, oh, look, there's some footprints. They must have gone that way. I mean, think about it in reverse. If you're searching for something and you're the ones you know, going out doing tracking roles, your GM always says to you, okay, roll search, roll awareness, roll spot hidden, or whatever it, you know the mechanic of the game is. You see the tracks, but we always follow them. How often do we actually go, I'm going to stop and look at the tracks and make sure they're actually real tracks? You'd never do it. No one does it. Nobody does it. Illusion is all about misdirection. If you want something tangible, cast a spell that makes something tangible. Illusions are for exactly the purpose of misleading, so make sure you use them for that, because they don't create tangible effects. At least, not yet, and we'll get to that a little bit later. So next up is Malleable Illusion. So starting at 6th, you can cast an Illusion spell, and as long as it has a duration of 1 minute or longer, you can use your action to change the nature of it, providing you can still see it, and providing it remains within its normal parameters. Now, there's a lot to be said for Malleable Illusions. So first and foremost, there's no level distinction, so that means your cantrips are good to go. So you can set up your cantrips, and then when sometime during that duration if you need to change them you can change them it means you don't have to recast it's not really very useful for your cantrips because you know being able to cast cantrips over and over and over again repeatedly you know is the the benefit of them but it is there if you ever needed it for whatever reason perhaps you know you want to cast it and then you need to keep quiet now you can change the illusion afterwards without necessarily having to speak it doesn't say you have to speak it just says you can change it usually probably an act of will or something but then you know that's to be interpreted by your dm but it is there in an emergency but i mean what 
it really works well for is your level spells, you know, the ones that are slot based, the ones that you have a finite amount of per day. That's where it really comes into play. So let's go with another example. Say you're in a dungeon and you're at a four way split and you set up your silent image. You put a wall in front of you which is visible on one side and obviously invisible on your side so you can see through and they can't see you. Yes, that is a thing you can do, just be aware of it. And then you set up a wall on, say, the right path. So anything that then runs in will just see that the path arcs around to their, to their right from their perspective. So say they come in and they don't check the walls because then if they're new in the area they're not going to bother to check the walls especially if you know they're on the run or you know you're on the run and they're after you and they could head down the right corridor now if there's more of them coming you could change the illusion and you could swap the wall so you could put the wall from your right on your left so that when they come down the other corridor from their perspective they see a wall and then they go, oh, okay, well, we'll take the other route. So you can then start splitting up your pursuers. But Malleable Illusion never says just how many times you can do this. Now, I would interpret it as as long as the illusion is running, you can change it as often as you like within those parameters. It doesn't say only once, it just says use an action to change it. So maybe you could change it again. Perhaps you could put up a third wall and it basically becomes a dead end and then put down a floor panel that looks like a pit. So then, you know, your third group of assailants might run up. Let's not go dropping into that. And then they go back the way they came. Now, I mean, it's all very subjective. It could happen. It could not. It all depends on how they interact with the illusions, if they interact with them at all. But that's really not the point. The point is to give you ideas on how the thing could work but check with your dm and make sure you know you come to an agreement on how the ability functions i mean if i were going to rule it as a dm myself i would say you could change it as often as you want within the the time frame because what would be the point in only being able to change it once you'd be kind of pointless but i mean it, it would have its functions i suppose but you know just just make sure before you get started so this ability kicks in at level six which is around the area where you get what I would consider to be your bread and butter spell, Major Image. So a 20 foot cube, a visual effect, also includes sound, smells and temperature. So you can't really go wrong with that. Not only that, you can move it around at whim, just by using your actions. But when you're done with it, again your malleable image comes into play and you can change it for something else, something that's more useful to the situation. You know, but remember the fact that it's about subtlety, it's about misleading. So you can't do it in front of something else without making, you know, the whole illusion go wrong. But that being said, however, the illusion of a wizard changing into something else, that's a bit of a different story. But again, you know, you need to tailor it to the situation. So not only is Major Image your bread and butter spell, it's also really good when you get to higher levels because when you put it in a 6th level slot, you don't need to concentrate on it and it remains until it's dispelled. It becomes permanent. Permanent. Now that is great. Now if your DM has turned around and said, okay, you can use your malleable illusions as an action whenever you want, then you can change the illusion as often as you want, as long as you can see it and it lasts until someone comes along to dispel it. And of course, subtlety is the key. Subtlety is always the key. So if someone comes along and they see something that they couldn't really care less about, if they're not going to investigate it, then it's just going to stay there. No one's going to come along and start poking and prodding it if it's, you know, if you've done your job correctly. If you've made it subtle enough that it's going to work, then there's, people have no need to come along and start questioning it. For the same reason, then, if they're not going to question it, they're not going to dispel it. I'm just going to quickly touch on this uh, because I can. But the illusionary self that you get at level 10 to create the illusionary duplicate of yourself to avoid getting hit by an attack, which is fine. You know, it's great for in combat. But realistically, if you're doing your job correctly, you should never have need of this. And it's a one-shot deal. You know, you get to use it once before you have to take a, a short or long rest. 
I mean, being able to use it every short rest is fine, but I just think that level 10 is a little bit too late for it to be of any very practical use, especially if you've got decent spells that pretty much do the same thing. Mirror Image has been pretty much top of the rung for a long time now. Even It's even better than something like Displacement, because of basically when you work out the percentages of how often you're going to get hit, you know, by by the time you've burnt through all your mirror images, the combat's probably over anyway. I mean, I guess that's why they didn't bother to carry displacement over from the earlier editions and then just went with mirror image. It's, it is the superior spell, really. I mean, not only in effect, but also in level efficiency. It's one level lower. And, you know, you get all of those benefits for a lower level spell. It's, it's just a no-brainer, isn't it? But again, we're getting a bit off topic. So now we hit level 14 and illusory reality makes all your illusions go into overdrive. Choose one inanimate non-magical object that's part of the illusion and make that object real. You can do it on your turn while the spell is ongoing. The object remains real for one minute. The object can't deal damage or otherwise directly harm anyone. The key there is directly because this just sounds like a challenge to me and I can make it happen. Let's talk about the possibilities of illusory reality and making things real. So it says, quite clearly, one object, which means no real creatures. But that's fine, because if you remember what we were talking about for the entire video, subtlety is the key. Subtlety is the whole point. So, you know, illusionary creatures isn't really going to be a, a big help to you anyway. Even if you did have, like, an illusionary creature like a dragon, for example, and it was breathing fire, even using this ability, you wouldn't be able to make the fire do any damage. But there are other ways around it if you know what it is you're looking for. First and foremost, and this is probably the most important aspect of this, understand that inanimate does not mean immobile. So a car, for example, is an inanimate object. You know, you have them in, in real life. Your game console is an inanimate object. Your PC is an inanimate object. But they still have moving parts. And thus, they do move. You know, disk trays and stuff open and it's the same principle so even though an inanimate object made real by this effect can't cause damage itself if you had an illusion of a catapult and then you made that real as long as you've got some ammunition to put into said catapult you can then start using that and that would deal damage uh, blister is the same same deal if the illusionary blister is then created to be real and you had some genuine blister bolts to put into it, it would have an effect because it is real, it is movable and it's tangible. But you're making something real and when something is real, physics come into play. So real things are affected by other real things. So gravity is a good example. So if you create an illusion of a cage in the sky around a flying creature, and you make it real. The first thing that's going to happen is that creature isn't going to be able to fly anywhere. So it's going to instantly start falling. Because the cage is made of say, solid steel or whatever. And it can't get out. It's going to fall. Because gravity is going to have its effect. Because it's real. So it then falls to the floor. And then the creature would take falling damage. The example they use is a bridge over a chasm. Which you can cross when you make the illusion real. Or at least give it enough time that you can get your party from one side to the other. But it still has the descriptor of illusion. So technically it should still be it should still be affected by things that work with illusions. So as an example, you could make that bridge and cross it, but when your pursuers come onto the bridge, it is still really an illusion, even though you have made it technically real. So you should be able to dismiss the illusion and thus dismiss the bridge, and then let your pursuers fall into the chasm beneath. An illusion of a pool of oil made real. Now, it has to function as if though it was real, so even though it might not cause any damage, you can set fire to oil, and it will burn. And anything in that area will burn, because it's not the illusion dealing damage, it's fire. It's real fire which is spreading through 
an illusion of oil made real. So it instantly covers the entire area. Now it's not the illusion causing damage, it is the outside source that is being brought to it. What if it's a ship in the ocean and you cause an illusion of a whirlpool and make that real and a ship sails into that? Now it might not cause damage but it would keep it immobile for long enough that you could make your escape. So what this ability is giving you, it's giving you the flexibility and the functionality that you need if you don't have the correct spell to call to hand, which is really useful. I mean, there are other things you can do with it as well. I mean, you can do something as simple as if you've seen the key to a door and you don't have a copy of it, you can just create the illusionary copy of it, make it real, and then use that to open the door. There's nothing stopping you doing that. Illusionary food made real might be able to deter a wild animal long enough for you to avoid having to encounter it. I mean, if your illusion's big enough, you could have an illusionary castle made real, which you can use as fortifications. There is literally no limit to the possibilities that illusions can offer. And when you can take the illusions and make them real, or at least part of them in some sense, you've got a lot of power there. And of course, when people's perception of reality is what reality is, and you're controlling that, how much influence does that really give you? Because it, in my book, that gives you a hell of a lot. So if you like this video on illusion, leave a like. If you want to see more from the channel, there's the subscription button and the notification bell. And if you've had some great experiences with illusions, why not tell me about it? So leave a comment down below because I always love to hear what people have been doing in their D&D games, especially when it comes to their variety of spell slinging. Have you created an amazing illusion that's completely changed the reality of everything around you? Or have you been unfortunate enough to fall into one of your DM's deviously set traps with an illusionary lure? Whatever the situation, let me know. I'd love to hear about it. And assuming that it's real and not just an illusion, I will see you guys next time at the gaming table. Oh yeah, and the cake is illusionary as well.